welcome everybody. It is absolutely lovely to have you all here. Um, and look, I'll start by acknowledging that all the Australian presenters and attendees today are meeting on Aboriginal land. And I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we are really thrilled to have such huge interest in today's event um, for, and for the opening session of the festival. And I'll hand over to John Stoney, the president of the uh, Australian Evaluation Society to officially open the event. John, you will need to unmute. <laughs> Ah, uh, there you are. It wouldn't be a, um, a conference unless somebody's done something like that. Well, everybody, uh, welcome to Festival. Um, also, I would also like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners and custodians of the lands where we're all beaming in from today. Uh, for myself, uh, coming in from Canberra, I'm on Ngunnawal country and I would like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. It's great to have an opportunity for us all get together um, and what continues to be um, in many parts of Australia and even overseas are challenging times for many. Um, I've just got some numbers from Bill before we opened up. We have 991 unique registrations. Uh, so that's going to cover 23 sessions with a combined attendance of about 6,800 uh, for this week, which I think is phenomenal to say the least. Uh, and I think that says something about the week's program, which I think is a, a, an interesting and an exciting one. Over the next five days, we're gonna have the opportunity to hear from a lineup of speakers who will cover a wide range of critical and engaging topics in evaluation. So we'll be looking at things such as evaluation capability and capacity building, cultural safety, public sector evaluation and design, self-assessment of competencies, multicultural evaluation and ethics. In addition to those sessions, there's also gonna be an opportunity to informally catch up most evenings through the Festival Club. So I'd like to acknowledge and thank the team that has organised Festival and also our speakers and presenters who are going to be here during the week. Uh, during this week, the AES is also going to be holding its Awards for Excellence and Evaluation, and that'll be at four o'clock on Wednesday. And that'll be immediately followed at 5pm by our annual general meeting, where we're going to be announcing the incoming AES board, and we'll also be announcing our new AES fellows. Uh, and on, at our closing session on Friday, we'll also be announcing the location and the theme for AES 22. So yes, we will be launching the return of our international conference and a return to being able to get together face to face. So I'm conscious that everyone here is pretty keen to get into things, uh, as am I, I'm keen to hear the, our three guest speakers. So I'm happy to declare Festival open, enjoy the week, and back to you, Eleanor. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. It's great to have you to launch the event. Um, so today we have an incredible lineup of speakers to kickstart the festival with some provocative thoughts about the state of evaluation. Um, I'll introduce our three speakers and then I'll hand over. Um, so our first speaker is Sky Trudgett and she's a proud mother and First Nations woman who's currently completing a PhD in Indigenous data sovereignty and models of care for high risk young people at the University of New South Wales. Sky is also the CEO of Kawa and Black Impact Lead at the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence in Redfern. Sky is an experienced social researcher and brings a unique approach to evaluation which continue, considers sustainable First Nations governance and community. So Sky will be followed by Margaret Crawford, who is the Auditor General of New South Wales. Um, we've, we feel very lucky to, um, to have found this time in Margaret's very busy day. Uh, Margaret has many years experience as a senior executive across large and complex public sector organisations, including the Victorian Department of Human Services, the Australian Taxation Office, the New South Wales Road and Traffic Authority and Australia's largest local government, Brisbane City Council. And before becoming Auditor General, Margaret held the position of Deputy Secretary at the New South Wales Department of Family and Community Services. And finally, we'll hear from our international speaker, Mary Abdo. So Mary's the Managing Director of the Centre for Evidence and Implementation in Singapore. <clears throat> she has lived in Asia since 2012, supporting organisations to develop strategies and capture innovations that generate impact across more than 25 countries. In her role with CEI, Mary supports organisations to maximise the impact of the programs they fund, including through evaluation, evidence synthesis and effective implementation. So we know that evaluators are naturally very curious, so please post your questions during using the chat function throughout the presentations. And once we've heard from our three speakers, there'll be time to pose some questions um, and I'll monitor the chat throughout. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sky to get us started. Sky, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Eleanor, um, and thanks, John, also for opening today. I also wanted to extend my acknowledgement to all traditional owners from the lands on which we're all dialing in from, um, and to our elders, past, present, and emerging. 
I also wanted to extend my acknowledgement to all First Nations people who are here today and who are participating across the week. Um, I particularly wanted to pay respects to AES's Indigenous Cultural and Diversity Committee, who have really been leading the way in terms of um, changing practice and use of evaluation and making sure that's a safe place for all First Nations people. So thank you very much for all of the efforts that have gone in um, to that important work um, and appreciate the fact that you've paved the way so far. Um, so I, my name is Skye. Um, you've got my intro already from Eleanor, so I'm not going to go too much uh, further than that. But I'm a Gamilaroi woman and I'm coming in from a Wabical country, so pay my respects to those people as well. Um, I was asked to come and present today and I was really excited and then I was a little bit perplexed. How do I do this justice? How do I say the right things? Because all of this came with the notion of, can you please provide something provocative? And I thought, yep, I reckon I can. And so uh, when I got to thinking, I started to try and understand or, or look back on what were the things that kind of came up all the time in the evaluation practice that we've been doing so far. Uh, and what I found was that there was this continual need as First Nations people to do evaluation in what might be termed the right way or how we might see it, which could be the white way. And so I started to think about, well, how do I talk about today? How do I bring this forward and still hold my truth? So I sat down for a while and I sent something off to Eleanor and to Greg. And then I wondered, as I sent that off, how provocative is this really? And so, <clears> hmm. <throat> The answer is probably a lot more than what you thought. And it was definitely more than what I thought as well. So uh, after the release of the program, I guess it isn't surprising that it took less than a day for the chatter to start kind of filtering back to me. Um, and with some people who I heard were pretty interested in what might be being said, uh, there was uh, some thankfulness about the rawness of uh, the title of uh, this introduction. And then there was a number of people who I hear were straight up outraged. And that's the nature of provocative introductions, I guess. But it did make me think, um, you know, well, why would that be the case? And so I had a lot of people think, who is this about? Who are you getting at? And it's really not as juicy as I think some people might have hoped but it's still honest and truthful. And the truth is, it is not about one single person. It is not about one single organization. The context of the uh, introduction today is actually about a systemic issue. Um, and it's the fact that we often hear, or I personally have often heard in our practice that we would like to do evaluation where we center self-determination, where we have this real desire for applying First Nations ways of knowing, doing and being and that we're really progressive in the face um, uh, in the face of resistance, sorry. And so, but all of that intent and goodwill seems to be met uh, with this misalignment of values and systems as it kind of gets into the work. And so there's this kind of degree of discomfort, which I think contributes um, to the experience uh, of, of why these things show up. And so often what I kind of have seen is that there's some subsequent behaviours that come along with that. Um, and that seems to look like a, an attempt to then steer what is our First Nations practice towards something that is a bit more in line with the methodological kind of concepts of the dominant culture. And so within this liminal space between our First Nations practice and what it ends up being, this is where I really do see uh, racism uh, raise its face. And so this is the part that I would like to address. This is why the conversation today. Um, and so I kept wondering then, all of that, why would there be outrage? Why is it so outrageous? that an Aboriginal woman would stand up today and say, my path here so far has been really hard and it's been really lonely and that is not good enough. Where are all the other Aboriginal people? We need to have a place here. 
And then why is it so outrageous uh, that I would suggest that patriarchal colonialism continues to show its face within our First Nations evaluation practice still today? It's not good enough. And why is it so outrageous that I would suggest that some commissioning organisations just don't get it? And it's also not good enough. So that being the case, I asked those who felt outraged to sit and think about it for a bit. Sit with a feeling. It is your conscience saying that there's some work to do. So those people who are interested in what this might be about, I would ask you to hold it because interest is a core ingredient of change. And for those people who really enjoyed the rawness uh, of the, the title or the introduction here, um, I encourage you to keep sitting and resisting conformity and ask and inspire others to do the same. Because what we need in First Nations evaluation practice is a revolution. And that revolution has begun. So uh, many of you would know about the Cultural and Diversity Committee at AES and the revolution has started there. And we thank you yet again. Uh, last week, we heard from Community First Development who reminded us that it is community who determine outcomes. It is community that, that tell us what success looks like. And that is the place that we need to listen and you might. This week, we have a whole week that is spread in learning the opportunities. Um, sorry, it's that we have a whole week uh, where we have the opportunity to learn from revolutionaries, from nonconformists, and from change makers about what evaluation practice really could look like. Uh, so in case you don't know some of the events that are coming up already this week, uh, I encourage you to check out, obviously, the launch of the Cultural Safety Framework. Uh, the uh, Aboriginal, uh, building Aboriginal evidence base, our place on country, and of course, reimagining multicultural evaluation practice later in the week. Uh, sorry. Um, so that, sorry, this is the week. It's the first time I've ever taken notes. I took notes because I actually really wanted to make sure that I got everything. Um, so forgive me if it's a little bit rusty. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share with you, apart from the opportunities uh, this week to hear and learn a little bit more, I wanted to kind of talk to you about, well, what are the instances that we're seeing great evaluation work turn up in our space? And this is not to say that it's the only work that's happening, but it is to say that there's some really inspiring stuff that we should tune into. So um, in sharing that with you, there's a couple of organisations and projects that are really looking to shift mindsets and amplify the voice of First Nations people in sovereignty and evaluation practice. The first one, just getting my notes clear, uh, is applying a flexible approach to MEL for First Nations organisations. This one comes through a trust that we have worked with in the past. And what they're working to do is centre both ways evaluation, evaluation and male strategies that work for First Nations peoples and organisations, as well as the community that they're representing and a trust who is funding part of that work. It has been really interesting. You can read a little bit more about that on our NCIE website and blog from Black Impact. There's also been some, sorry, There's also been some incredibly inspiring work that's coming out of our Department of Communities and Justice with their Aboriginal Knowledge Program and then their partnership now with ABSEC to support the co-design of Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous data governance across the outer home care and child protection continuum. And that work is happening at the moment. Uh, and there's an invitation for all of community to participate in that going forward. And you'll start to see that come out in comms later in this month or towards next month. And then we've also been working with a group called Seed Mob, who I'm sure many of you actually know about already. And Seed Mob are applying First Nations ways of um, knowing, doing and being towards their impact framework. And so starting to share with others exactly what it is that they're doing 
what success looks like in more of a, um, a First Nations kind of concept and way. And um, I would encourage all of you to, to look up Seed Mob and understand a little bit more about who they are and what they do. Um, we've been thankful enough to be working with another organisation. I'm not sure if I can share who they are just yet, but another First Nations organisation who are looking to support allies who are funding efforts across the First Nations space to channel their investment in a way that makes good sense and has huge impact across multiple places uh, for First Nations people and, and communities. And their work has been incredible in looking at how does a dollar investment come in and how does it look different as it goes across First Nations organisations, how do we put dollars into values? And so that's been a really interesting project that's still emerging now. And then of course, there is uh, the grassroots organisation Maranooka, who I'm sure most people know about, who are trying to weave all these bits and pieces together. So they've established their First Nations data governance uh, to enact First Nations data sovereignty principles. They have a platform that holds all of their data and they use this approach to do rapid evaluation of the initiatives that are happening on the ground, as well as holding their whole with funders and government, um, and then allowing themselves to really focus on what we're calling truth indicators. So this is what are the thoughts, feelings, just experiences of community on the ground around whether change is happening or not. And finally, there's the efforts that are happening in community that I wanted to share with you. And then there's the efforts that are happening in bringing more community into this space. And so I would like to uh, just also highlight the array project that Clear Horizon and ABC Foundation are working on in strengthening the capacity of First Nations women uh, to participate in evaluation and then to know the rules, but then to break the rules and feel really confident in doing evaluation practice their way. Um, so I'm really excited that these ladies will be stepping into this space in the future. Um, they're amazing, amazing women. So please check out what they're doing and get behind that project. Um, so uh, all of that is um, my provocative start to the week. I'm not sure how provocative it really is, um, but I would like to encourage everyone to, to dig a little bit more into the spaces that I might have just quickly shared at the moment. I hope you have a wonderful week um, and enjoy Festival. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eleanor. Thank you so much, Sky. What a great start to the week and a great shout out for lots of the important sessions we've got coming up um, in front of us as well. Um, Margaret, I'll pass to you now to talk a bit more about, um, about performance auditing its relationship to evaluation. <clears throat> okay, and thank you very much, Eleanor. And um, thanks for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here today. And wow, well, um, Sky, I... I don't know about provocative, but you've certainly provoked me um, to do better and to learn and to learn much more. Um, so, but can I begin by also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm speaking to you from today? I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, any First Nation person that's joining us online today. <clears throat> um, Okay, so look, I think it's pretty fair to say that we're living in unprecedented times. Uh, and in that context, I hope everyone is well. Um, but look, here in New South Wales, our government is, has really been in emergency mode or emergency response mode for over 18 months. Um, they've had to deal with raging bushfires um, right across all parts of our state, and then floods, and then and still the COVID-19 pandemic. They're having to act really fast, um, and there really isn't a script for, the, for any of this. So in this context, um, the assurance provided by audits and uh, by other forms of review and scrutiny is arguably more important than ever. <clears throat> So in the very short time I have this afternoon, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the role of an Auditor General and my performance audits and how these work uh, with the broader system of review and evaluation that you're all part of. Um, so look, my starting premise is that at a time when government is, is um, impacting so much of our lives, uh, we've all got an interest in it succeeding. 
Uh, we want to know that governments are doing the right things and in the right way and learning from mistakes. So uh, just stepping back for a moment, there's actually been an Auditor General in New South Wales for nearly 200 years. Um, I just hasten to add at that point that I've only been here five years, um, so not nearly all of that time. And, um, and it's also fair to say that performance auditing is relatively a relatively new discipline in that sort of the context of those 200 years. So in New South Wales, performance audits have been part of our mandate since around the 1990s. <clears throat> so in essence, performance audits go beyond uh, the financial audit assessment of an agency's financial management and reporting uh, to assess how well um, public money is used. Um, they're looking at the effectiveness and the efficiency of government programs and activities. So look, the, the purpose of this work is really twofold. Um, we want to identify performance gaps uh, so the government can, can improve its practices. Um, but also um, the goal is to support the parliament to, a whole, to hold government to account for delivering what it says it will deliver. The role is incredibly privileged. It benefits from a number of protections that I don't think are afforded to all evaluators. Uh, so the key is its independence. So the Auditor General has a fixed eight year term and uh, can't be reappointed. Um, and I can't really be sacked um, unless I go completely mad. And most commentators will, will always say that auditors general are always a little bit mad. Um, so nor can I be directed regarding what I choose to audit um, or to the scope of that work. My office has unprecedented access to information Legislation actually compels the agencies that we audit uh, to respond to my requests. And if they don't, there's also an ancient, ancient provision that says I can recommend uh, that those individuals um, pay be stopped. Um, I haven't resorted to that yet, but I'm pretty tempted at times. Um, so look, we, uh, we don't have to bid or compete for work. Um, the government funds my office to conduct performance audits and agencies can't refuse when we choose them. But most importantly, we report our findings to the parliament rather than to the agency we audit and our reports are always made public. Okay, so given all those privileges, it's, it's also natural that we have certain obligations as well. We must comply with all auditing auditing standards and meet professional obligations uh, to be of the highest integrity. And every statement we make must be backed by evidence. And we must allow the agency, agency head to respond to any findings we make. And this response is also published with the report. All this means uh, that our work respected and trusted. It is truly independent, objective and transparent. Uh, we're really beholden uh, to no one other than the New South Wales Parliament. So, so yeah, so it's a pretty privileged um, position to be in, to be able to um, conduct performance audits with all of those privileges. But there are limits and this is where you come in with the broader, um, where the broader system of research, review and evaluation is, is just so important. Uh, for example, performance audits cannot comment on the merits of government policy, only on how well it is implemented. You can. We can only audit government agencies, not the non-government sectors that are commissioned to do much of the work of, of government you can. Secrecy, secrecy provisions mean we cannot speak publicly about matters we have found beyond what we have published in our report. Again, you can. Um, to be truly independent, we cannot provide advice or guidance to try to help agencies to do better. You can. Uh, we cannot partner or collaborate with the agencies we audit or with other stakeholders, but you can. 
And finally, we can only undertake a limited number of performance audits in any given year. Usually that's around 17 or so. And this is clearly not enough uh, when the need to evaluate the actions of government to help improve outcomes um, for citizens is just so important. So I guess my point is we really need to maximise the diversity of the tools, techniques, uh, capabilities in this broad system of review and evaluation. I think that's in everyone's interests. Uh, so look, I'm gonna pause there and thank you all for listening. And I will be happy to join um, my fellow presenters to answer any questions that you have uh, following our next speaker. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Margaret. And what a great series of ideas and thoughts about where evaluators can play. Um, and particularly some of those extra benefits from the freedoms that are afforded to evaluators. Um, I will now hand over to Mary Abdo. Mary's our international um, presenter zooming in from Singapore. Take it away, Mary. Thank you. Let me just get my slides up one second. As ever, a little bit of trickiness with that. Okay, just checking you can all see my slides. Give a good nod if you can. Yes, okay, perfect. All right, uh, so my name is Mary Abjo. I am Managing Director at uh, Center for Evidence and Implementation in Singapore. Um, I'm an ex-consultant, hence the slides, so can't ever show up to anything without a good slide deck. Um, I am going to be covering off um, evidence and evaluation in Asia, massive topic. Uh, whirlwind tour in 10 minutes. I will try to provoke some thinking, but I will in no way do justice to this enormous topic. So I will try to just pique your interest and we'll see how that goes. Um, so I think some of you will be familiar with the work of CEI. I'll just give a quick introduction. Uh, Center for Evidence and Implementation uh, is Australian headquartered. Uh, we have offices around the world in Singapore and in London, uh, as well as in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, CEI is a mission-driven not-for-profit evidence intermediary and advisory organization. And our mission is to help get the best evidence into policy and practice to improve the lives of vulnerable people. Um, and we, of course, as a part of that, have a strong focus on evaluation. Um, we are also always hiring. So please subscribe to our newsletter so that you may learn when you can come and work with us because we want great evaluators to come and work with us. Uh, so I'm gonna focus in on three big ideas today. Uh, and I should preface this by saying, I mentioned I have a background as a consultant. I'm not an evaluator by training. I am a new arrival uh, to evaluation land. And um, as a result, some of what you'll see is a bit macro, is a bit looking at some of the trends in the region um, and letting you know, particularly from a point of view of philanthropy, how I think uh, things are playing out here. So um, first, there is an urgent need to identify and scale what works. Uh, second, that uh, philanthropy has an important role uh, to play in addressing the needs that we see and that we as uh, an evaluation community need to start at square one to support this sector. So let's dive in. As, as you can see, a, a, a weeks long seminar would probably not be enough to cover any one of these topics. So we'll try and do that in the next 10 minutes. Um, so the first thing I wanna start by saying is the problems aren't going away. So we all know that uh, we work on social issues every day, but I just want to zoom in on one in particular. I, my background is predominantly in, in looking at uh, education, mostly in emerging markets. And um, the chart that you see is looking, so we'll just zero in on this particular issue. It can help us see what some of the scale of issues are uh, in Asia and, and more broadly. Um, but if we look at this chart is just showing us the out of school population by region and the way that it's changed over a 10 year period between 2007 and uh, 2017. So actually we, we start in 2000 and then you can see that we've got a year by year from 2007 to 2017. Um, at the time that the uh, Millennium Development Goals were created and in the years just afterwards, so between about um, 2000 and 2011, we saw this really precipitous drop in the number of out-of-school children. So the whole world is focused on this issue. You see a massive push in school building, particularly in places like uh, India and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and you know really attacking this access uh, challenge. 
And that happens for about 10 years. And in the years uh, between 2011 and 2017, those numbers barely shift at all. So in fact, even between say 2018 and 2019, that number would have gone from say 260 million children out of school to say 259 million children out of school. So that implies that at the current rates, we have to wait 260 years before we get all out of school children into school. Not something that we want to see happen. And what, what's really going on is that we've got the quote unquote low hanging fruit of the children who are going to go into school. And right now what the issue is is that we've got a lot of children who are out of school for more complex reasons. So uh, for economic needs, because, because of uh, issues around girls' education, more likely to be disabled children, rural children, conflict affected. So you have all these kids who are still out of school. And historically, Asia has had a really large share of these out of school children. And so this is a massive issue. Then add the pandemic just what we all needed, uh, COVID has made all of this vastly worse. So uh, there was an estimate um, going around that about between about 50 to $60 million, excuse me, billion dollars would be needed uh, to fill the hole in national uh, education funding uh, prior to COVID-19. That estimate is now up to $200 billion per annum in uh, new funding that is not currently in the global education system to get these kids into school. Um, there's an estimated 35 million children who dropped out of school in APAC in the last uh, 18 months. Uh, and those children, especially if they're from low income families, are much less likely to return to school the longer they are away. And this will have an effect on things like child labor, child marriage, child trafficking, exploitation, uh, and of course, uh, hampering the life chances of many millions of children. So why am I bringing this up? It's to say that the scale of the challenges that we're facing have really never been greater. And I think um, that's a backdrop for talking about the rest of this conversation is that we really need urgently to think about what works uh, to solve these issues. Now, enter stage right, we have uh, a really exciting thing going on in Asia against this backdrop, which is also that we see a massive increase in regional wealth. So Asia already has the largest proportion of the world's billionaires. Uh, but actually the world is, uh, the region is projected to be home to a third of them by 2023. 80% of the fastest growing wealthy populations in the world re re reside in Asian nations. And this is a population that has really, I mean, massively diverse population. It's, it's uh, inappropriate to call it a population, but let's just say regionally, there are very strong philanthropic traditions, often tied to religious traditions in many of the region's major uh, population centers. So we see strong traditions of giving. And so it is, uh, let's say, good news for the sector that looks to, um, you know, that needs to get additional capital to solve some of these problems, that we have an influx of this philanthropy. And what's interesting is that a lot of these philanthropists are the second and third generation um, who are shifting from, say, more traditional ways of giving away funding through to uh, a much more strategic approach to grant making and looking to mix that up with other kinds of approaches often derived from the market like social enterprise, uh, social business, uh, impact investing to try and address some of those challenges and also using vehicles like family offices to address that. So in Singapore alone, we saw about 200 family offices open in 2020. Uh, that was on a base of several hundred. So it's uh, really, really rapid growth. That's in part, um, Singapore's emerging as a regional philanthropic hub in part because of the flight of capital out of Hong Kong and also uh, Singapore emerging as a, as a really safe regional hub for capital. And so growth in, in philanthropy uh, implies growth in demand for understanding impact, which is where the evaluation community comes in. And so I think it's important to talk a little bit about how philanthropists are different than government as, as commissioners of evaluation. This is all very gener heavily generalized. It will depend on where you are. It will depend on the type of philanthropist. You know, if they're deploying $2 million a year, that's going to look very different than if they're deploying $60 million or $200 million a year. Uh, but in general, uh, they are more independent uh, but that also means that they do have lower accountability if they decide they want to give all their money to uh, right-wing causes, as many philanthropists in my country, the US, <laughs> would like to do, uh, then there's really nothing that anyone who disagrees with those political views uh, can do about it. Um, they tend to be agile, uh, so faster speed, lower bureaucracy, um, where you might be in you know, year, years long conversation about doing something government, often in philanthropy, you can get that moving quite quickly. There's also an innovation orientation, which we'll touch on in a minute a little bit more. 
And often you've got smaller teams in philanthropies with less in-house experience and evaluation than you might find in institutional philanthropy, particularly in um, uh, countries with a stronger philanthropic tradition of, of institutional philanthropy. And finally, you do see more of a, a focus on legacy, personal connection with impact. Um, this all also ties back to the fact that a lot of regional philanthropy is uh, I mentioned not institution, but also they might be more likely to be operating foundations. Uh, that means they run their own programs and they are vastly more likely to be tied to family businesses. So in this case, if you're running a, a philanthropy or the philanthropic arm of a business, your board uh, may well be your in-laws, your grandparents, uh, you know, it is a family operation. So there's a real focus on the family's name, family's legacy and its connection with impact. Uh, but I will say, Looks can be deceiving. So big problem, we have big needs for lots and lots of social issues that are happening, getting worse because of the pandemic. And phil philanthropy is one way of, of potentially helping to close that gap. But we always think about philanthropy as being huge and it is huge. So uh, even, and this is in 2019, foundation assets by country, there's an, an estimate from uh, UBS who did a, a global a report on philanthropy and they estimated about $1.5 to $2 trillion held in global foundation assets. And that number is only getting bigger. So let's say that's a, let's call it a solid $2 trillion held in foundation assets. And that sounds like a massive amount of money and it is. But if philanthropy is only typically at, a, at the most deploying about 10% of that per annum or about 150 to $200 billion per annum, that's actually not a huge amount of money. That's equivalent to about the GDP of New Zealand or the state of Oregon in my country. Uh, so what that means is that, yes, the capital is very valuable, but it can't fill gaps. So what does that mean in terms of philanthropy's role? Uh, philanthropy has to be catalytic. That's, I think, just if I leave you with nothing else, I would say philanthropy's role is to be catalytic. And it really needs to, sorry, I set the timer for myself, I just started going off. Um, uh, philanthropy has to be catalytic. So uh, what we know, and this is a great quote uh, that I can't take credit for, that the road to scale leads through public systems. And so when philanthropy is thinking about um, how it needs to make an impact, that should be looking at uh, understanding the kinds of models that we can test and evaluate that can then get rolled out uh, into public systems and in Asia, and I would argue in a lot of the uh, developing world, um, that will also include private systems. And I know that can sometimes be difficult for us coming from countries that have strong uh, sectors uh, in terms of public provision of services, but in India alone, um, half of young children go to private schools. Uh, that's massively more in some countries in terms of um, early years sector, higher education sector, private hospitals, uh, polyclinics are run by private companies. And I think we need to acknowledge that in how we think about uh, uh, evaluating and uh, instigating models. And finally, I just want to talk about a complication here. And I said, um, we have to start at square one. So, one, so I'll just give you a moment to read this quote. In Asia, the nonprofit sector is still in variable stages of development. Uh, what that means is that in terms of um, channels of giving, ability to deliver effective services, capacity on the ground, and even just the basic information on issues and needs is not as well developed in many countries in uh, wider Asia as it would be in other geographies. Uh, and so what that means for evaluators is that there is typically a very limited evidence base in the region. So most evidence is produced in the global north of English speaking wealthier countries. So even if you have a proven intervention, contextualizing it here, uh, it means often adapting in an environment where there isn't great administrative data and where you really have to be testing whether or not solutions developed in other parts of the world are relevant and appropriate for these uh, environments. Um, I think going back to what Sky was saying earlier, uh, attending to community and context in all of these very, very hugely diverse, linguistically, ethnically diverse communities that uh, are represented in Asia uh, means um, accepting that there isn't great evidence already out there. Um, we also might run into issues of diff different capabilities of field staff. There, are, there just isn't the body of institutions doing evaluation work in many environments. And there's also uh, differences in terms of infrastructure availability, even to the point of things like in, uh, digital connectivity it may not be uh, existent in the same way in terms of what evaluators have access to. Uh, and also, I think it's important also to acknowledge that there are 
scale differences in how we have to think about doing work in some of these countries. I was speaking to a friend the other day who used to run UNICEF projects uh, for girls in um, uh, in India, in North India, and she was doing a program on conditional cash transfers, and there were 17 million girls involved in the pilot for her program. So I think given that I live in a country with 6 million people, so just a totally uh, a different way of thinking about scale and uh, needs in this context. And finally, lots of donors are also new. So taking it back to philanthropy, lots of donors are, are sort of new visitors to evidence land. And I think there's a tendency as a in this sector to you know it can be quite academic it can be quite crunchy it can be quite off putting to people who are not experts and these are folks who are often really well educated coming out of the business community and they are coming in maybe having programs that their family's been running for 20 years and they it's it these conversations have to be handled sort of delicately to not uh, a scare them off from evaluation or b disincentivize them because you don't want to tell them that a program that they uh, love and have been running for a long time doesn't work so that's, those are all contextual factors that are really interesting to, to think about. Um, and many just don't even know how to do monitoring, let alone evaluation that goes for the donors and the community organizations that you may be working with. Um, so I'd say when we're talking about using good evidence, we're often starting from square one. That's not to say across the board, you have some very sophisticated uh, organizations that are doing this work and the learning curve that they're on that many organizations on is really fast. So there be people who've gotten started as uh, donors in the last five years. And within that five year period, they've educated themselves to a really strong level and are able to commission evaluation work well. But I wouldn't say that's the dominant uh, characteristic of a lot of the organizations. So, so what does this mean for you? Like, why am I sharing this with you? Why do I think it's interesting? Why should Australian evaluators care? Uh, and look, you have given you a cute little dragon with a cute little uh, kangaroo. Uh, first is that given the scale of these issues, there are real opportunities to make difference by bringing your brains, your talents uh, to the region in terms of trying to think about how you can engage an evaluator there. There's also great tailwinds. I mean, I think Australia is really well positioned to work in the region uh, because, particularly because you've got really strong diplomatic trade, cultural academic ties, you've got the new uh, Monash Indonesia campus, you've got Monash Malaysia, you've got RMIT Vietnam, you've got UNSW and Deakin who've got very strong presence in India. Uh, so there's really strong Australian ties into the region and obviously all the trading ties that exist. I also think it's just a huge amount to learn as an evaluator in this region. Um, so some of the world's leading organizations doing this work are already active, uh, particularly in South Asia. So it's a huge amount of work being done by folks like j -Pal and some really interesting innovations in terms of intervention uh, and evaluation design. So for example, I came across a team the other day who were doing AI to drive behavior change through social media, which is incredibly creepy and also probably going to shape all of our lives. Um, and I think there's also good potential for Australian evaluators to help accelerate adoption of good evaluation practices in the region uh, and also to learn uh, how uh, evaluation might be done a bit, a bit differently and particularly how to engage with uh, communities in diverse contexts. And um, also, I would just say there are also lots of donors at home in Australia who are also engaging with some of these questions and involved in some of these networks uh, that also need good advice. So learn more, shameless plug for our conference. You can still access uh, some of the conference uh, uh, CEI uh, co-host with Monash University, a um, a summit uh, every two years. Uh, and the last one was held in March. Tickets are still available if you'd like to go. There's some really interesting um, talks that were done there, including by the likes of J-PAL, uh, who bring in some interesting contexts from uh, uh, the world outside of Australia. Uh, so with that, I will close. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary. So we've covered a huge amount of ground um, with our three presentations today. And I'm conscious we've had a very rich conversation happening in the chat. Um, and some leads itself to, to some, some questions and some, some were quite practical questions. Um, one which I'll knock over straight away, which is, Mary, can you briefly describe a family office, which you referred to in your presentation? Uh, I'm probably going to get the technical definition wrong and somebody's just put this in the field, but basically, um, and so uh, Dr. Google can tell you more than I can, but basically it's a structure that is starting, you're starting to see more and more of, which is like um, a vehicle uh, that allows very, very wealthy people to organize their investments, giving uh, and plan for legacy. And that often takes the form of having kind of a professional advisory team that you would bring to help handle your wealth. 
That makes sense. Yeah, and thank you, Brian, for posting a definition in the chat. But the one thing I did want to point to, just as sort of an overarching question for all our panellists, is you've all spoken about how evaluation intersects with a lot of other professions and industries. Um, and I was keen to hear from each of you any suggestions that you have about how evaluators can help bridge those gaps and how you better connect evaluation and other pro professions that we work alongside. Sky, it's been a while since we heard from you. I might bounce back to you to start with. Maybe if you could make a few comments about, about how we bridge the gaps from evaluation across to the people we work with. Yeah, um, so I think some of the ways that we really try and do that within our practice, we have uh, a few kind of key principles. And so obviously our overall intent is that uh, First Nations people and other people from many cultures uh, step back into what we would call our ancient wisdom. So, we, you know, we really kind of believe in this fact that uh, as First Nations people, we've been doing evaluation since time immemorial. We, we use evaluative thinking and practice to understand uh, how we make, uh, like how we make cultural choices, when it, does ceremony need to occur, uh, how do we care for country and when is the right time to be doing that, how do we care for ourselves and and when do we do that also? So there's lots of decisions that get made using evaluative thinking um, in our everyday lives. And that's true for all of us, I believe. So I think there is a place for everyone. And so I feel like uh, one of the key things is allowing everyone the opportunity to build confidence, to kind of step back in and lead in evaluation as opposed to uh, us as uh, consultants being the expert to need to keep coming in over and over in fact we do need to build that skill set within communities to continue doing that themselves um, I guess that one is nerve-wracking for some because that means doing ourselves out of a job but I think it should uh, at the end of the day absolutely be our intent um, but some of the things that we would do uh, is obviously spending a lot of time in community we like to kind of you know spend at least a week um, just being and so no general outputs to kind of go with that it's just how do we build really good relationships how do we let people you know dig in and understand who we are suss us out a little bit and make some decisions on behalf of themselves as community is this the right person to be coming in here should they be you know helping us make decisions are they a good fit and so really kind of leaving that decision making in the hands of community. Uh, we also try and employ uh, at least one local person on every single job that we do, uh, that their payment is aligned the same as any other consultant who is on that job. And by doing that, what we get to do is, is demonstrate that local knowledge, uh, a good understanding of the, the kind of structures that exist in community, uh, the pitfalls, um, the the kind of things that just happen and the people that you need to be connected to, that is a really uh, key person to have in a successful project. And so that is not a skill that can be learned. It is something that comes from living and, and being in community and having that local knowledge. So it's another really important part uh, that we would encourage people to bring into evaluation practice. And then Obviously, this part of uh, working across a continuum that uh, evaluation starts within community, um, it's already happening. And so how do we tap back into the moments where community is saying, these are the things that we're experiencing. This is the, the potential ways that we could solve this challenge. And maybe it's with program or maybe it's with collaboration or maybe it's with something else um, that, that is some policy or some design stuff that we need. And so acknowledging what is being called out early on and then wrapping evaluation um, and, and develop, developmental evaluation across all of those parts um, and playing that support role uh, so that community can continue doing this in themselves is probably how we would definitely see that we we bridge that gap and um, and then step out as well. Oh, that's fantastic points you make there, Sky. I'll ask my, the other panelists before we move to a question from the chat. Margaret, did you want to reflect on any any thoughts about how we can bridge the connection between evaluation and auditors and other people that we work with? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well, look. In some senses, I think that it's the diversity of the sector that's actually. Um, the strength of it and and really probably that's you know that's great and we don't need to bridge that any gaps we actually just need to recognize uh, the various capabilities the various approaches 
uh, that exist across. And I think that, that was what I was in part trying to draw out in my presentation, because there are certainly things uh, that we do in performance audit that a lot of other people don't do. But equally, there's so many things that we are not able to do that others can. So I think the real key there is to be just be uh, honest about the different abilities and skills that people bring to this profession overall. Um, and I guess be true be true to yourselves when you're um, uh, being, you know, bidding for work or, or doing work for agencies so that you don't try to, you know, present yourself as something you're not. Um, so, yeah, that's how, how I respond to your question. Well, it's a great, it's a great take on the, um, on the idea of bridging rather more about inclusion and recognition. Lovely reflections. Mary, I'll pass you to reflect on this one and then we have another sort of question emerging from the chat. So maybe start with this one and I'll pose the next one to you. Uh, sorry, start with which Start with which one? If you want to start with um, any reflections you have about how evaluators can bridge the connection between evaluation and the other professions that we work with and perhaps in your case, philanthropy. Yeah, I mean, look, I think for the question that will be on everyone's mind is deploying capital, right? And that's really grotesque way of just thinking about everybody wants to make social change. But at the end of the day, some people hold money and they have to distribute that to make change in the world. And whether that's a philanthropist or public sector, one of the things that I feel like we're always coming across is just justifying the value of evaluation. And I'd say that's particularly the case in, in geographies where evaluation is not as commonly done or where you have a state that has a need to project authority and um, kind of the being the best of all possible worlds. I, I live in that country that uh, may have a little bit of a concern about evaluation because it might, you don't want to look under rocks. Um, and, uh, it, and philanthropy also, right? You don't want to tell, a, you don't want to look at evaluation and say, well, well, <laughs> looks, looks like that thing we've been pouring money into for a decade didn't work. Uh, so I think it's, what I have been trying to do more in speaking to people is really just framing it as learning and about that we're always looking at the best and most efficient ways of getting to the, the, the outcome that we all want and that the evaluation process is should be seen as one not of audit but of, of learning. Um, and so that does help to reframe thinking and I think that particularly helps folks who are not maybe not as uh, not as uh, who are newer to evaluation, whether that's within government or within the philanthropic sector to frame up discussions with their stakeholders to help them understand what the value is. Well, fantastic. And Mary, I'll do the follow up question because there's sort of a series of, um, of posts in the chat, which you're getting, you referred in your presentation to the idea of looking for what works. And I think that that's been a very controversial kind of concept in, in the world of evaluation where there's lots of people looking at things like um, one of our commenters have mentioned human learning systems. Um, there's sort of two questions in there. Do you think we should be thinking about this idea of what works and who gets to decide what works? So if we sit that alongside self-determination, um, I might I might just hold with that one. If you want, had any reflections in that space? Do you mean what works in evaluation practice, or do you mean what works in interventions? I think you'd been talking about what works in interventions, but happy for you to take it either way. I think I'd rather take that one than evaluation. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, I'm not an evaluator by training, so I don't want to get into methodology. Uh, I just think it's important that we temper the what works question with the knowledge that what works is that what is published on what works is often published in places that don't address the reality, the lived experience and realities of many communities. Uh, and so I think what that means is just looking at generating it, A, being aware of that. So compiling as much as we possibly can about what does work and synthesizing evidence we can acknowledging the shortcomings of that evidence and then looking to fill the gaps in the evidence. And that's why things like systematic reviews and evidence and gap maps are so powerful because they do show us where we need to be focusing our energy to strengthen the evidence base. Uh, and so for example, uh, CEI in, in Singapore has just helped to establish a center with a, a foundation at the National University of Singapore that's gonna be focused on evidence translation in early childhood. There is a lot that is not known about how early childhood programs work in Singapore. That's you know, may be well covered in the international literature. And so a lot of the work that we're doing and trialing is about testing how it works in context here and hopefully then contributing to the learning in the sector. Fantastic. Thanks for those reflections, Mary. That's really helpful. 
Um, then there's another cluster of questions, which is sort of directed for Margaret, and this is about the idea of an evaluator general. Um, and there's a few questions, so I think we can confirm that Margaret's based in New South Wales. And there's a question about whether you think there might be a state-based equivalent of um, of the Indigenous Productivity Commissioner. So, <laughs> in terms of overall governance for this space, any reflections, Margaret? Well, <laughs> well, I might just um, <clears throat> start with the whole concept of an evaluator general, which has been you know around for quite a long time, I think it, but probably hasn't got a lot of traction. Um, so I suppose my reaction to it is really the more um, independent um, scrutiny of government, uh, the better, um, I think. And so, yeah, an evaluator general that could be truly um, independent and could apply the same sort of professional scepticism that that we auditors apply um, and that would always have to publish outcomes, et cetera, would be good. I think there are still some, some real challenges or constraints to that role and they're, they're the sort of constraints that I face. And that goes to um, really data, good quality data um, and good quality performance indicators. I think um, there's been a lot of lip service paid to those sorts of things through, you know, various efforts for a program evaluation over many, many years. The government is still pretty immature um, in those areas and hmm, maybe isn't um, as committed uh, to the notion of evaluation as they perhaps sometimes portray. Uh, so, yeah, I think the more the merrier if that was possible. Um, but, yeah, we do have to start to invest in good data, good KPIs, uh, transparent reporting, those sorts of things, whether it's through an audit function or an evaluator function. The issue of uh, relationships more broadly with um, the Indigenous community, as I said before, there's some real constraints on my role to be able to collaborate and, and um, work with other stakeholders. That said, we certainly in any, uh, well, in a number of audits that we've undertaken, we've, we have um, got some expertise from, um, from community uh, to make sure that we're not just totally you know, off track. Um, and so the more that we do that and introduce that sort of um, view into our work, the better. Fantastic. And I would like to give Sky just the final word on that idea of should we have an Indigenous Evaluator General? Sky Reflections. Yes, uh, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think that the work and the vision of the Indigenous Evaluation Strategy and the concepts that are being floated there are incredible. I think potentially there's some um, ways that we could look a little bit more around how we preface uh, diversity across how community uh, do evaluation, use evaluation and where that kind of comes in and how community come in might be looked at a little bit more. But I think um, the concept uh, and the way that that could be held at a, a national level and then also at a state level would be really interesting and something that we should strive for. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Sky. And look, thanks to everybody who's participated today. It's been a really rich conversation in the chat. Really appreciate your time. We are bang on five o'clock.